Well, good evening, everyone. If you don't know me, I'm, my name is Mark Roth. I'm from uh, Alaska and Costa Rica. Sometimes in the winter I'm in Costa Rica, and sometimes I'm in Alaska in the summer. So my wife is right behind me. Hola. <laughs> you can tell she's working on her Spanish. <laughs> so... Um, this evening, Don asked me to speak to you, and so the title of my talk is um, The Hope of Glory. And I think this subject is a very important subject, and probably one of the most important things that I've studied and looked into in the past uh, 10 or 15 years. And it really struck me about 10 years ago when I was reading some scriptures in the Bible that perhaps I had been pre-programmed to believe certain things about our destiny and our future that maybe necessarily weren't in scripture. Uh, I can give you an example of that. Um, I was reading the book of Revelation, Revelation 21 and 22, and it, you know, I've always thought, oh, new heaven, new earth, there's only spiritual beings running around and everything is hunky-dory and we're all happy and and uh and then i started to really read what it said in the in the scripture and i realized oh wait a minute there's evil beings outside of the holy city mm -hmm. whoremongers and sorcerers and all kinds of evil people and there's a tree in the holy city that has leaves on it for the healing of the nations. Um, well, why would you have a tree in the holy city with leaves on it to heal the nations if there were no nations? And everybody was a spirit being and um, we had no physical people running around anymore. And so after reading that, I was kind of shocked a little bit, realizing that I had read this maybe a hundred times before and just read right over that and didn't because I had a preconceived notion in my mind that there were no human beings there. And that's called being programmed by religion, really, in a sense. And all religions have a tendency to program you to believe certain things. So I've decided in the rest of my life that I won't be hopefully won't be programmed and I'll read the scriptures for myself and interpret them for what they say. And I don't really expect that that will maybe turn out to be, you know, life changing for me. It's like, you know, in, in a certain sense of the word, you know, like we read the scripture that says true religion is to, to take care of the fatherless and the widow and the orphan and so you know that's that's really nice but how many religions really do that and how many times in the bible does it tell you to take care of the orphan and the fatherless and the widow anybody know the answer to that question well the answer to that question is 39 times mm. not just once not twice, not 10 times, but 39 times in the Bible, it tells you that you should be taking care of the widow and the orphan, the fatherless. Mm -hmm. And so have we practiced that in our lives? Have we put that into practice? Well, no, because religion teaches us to put money in the offering tray when it comes by and to sit in the pew and listen to the pastor speak and let the church or the church organization do those things. And we've fallen into a trap that way. And so I've learned some things. And so I was studying into a subject and what really piqued my study into this was Romans 11. I think it's verse 35 or something like that. I can go to my notes and get it. So it's Romans eleven twenty five, And I was reading that verse one day and, and it said, all Israel will be saved. And I thought, hmm, 
that must not really mean all. So I went back and I, and I studied the word in Greek. And, and lo and behold, it really does mean all. There's no other way to translate it in the Greek. It doesn't mean some of Israel will be saved. It doesn't mean the righteous of Israel will be saved. It just says all Israel will be saved. And so we know from reading a lot of Paul's writings that Israel is who? Anybody who's grafted in, right? Plus all of Israel, anybody who's an Israelite, which most people on this earth have Israelite blood in them. And so I, after I read that, I thought, wow, wait a minute. There's something strange about this statement, and, and why am I misinterpreting it? Well, I'd like to take you to a very familiar scripture, and that's John 3, verse 16. And we can start out in verse 14. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so much the Son of Man may be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so there's a qualifier here, right? The qualifier is that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And then it goes on and says, For God so loved the world, and I'm reading in the, in the Old King James, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So it makes that statement again, right? Whoever believes in Jesus will have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so in my mind, I always added a few words in here that some of the world might be saved. Don't we all add that in? Mm -hmm. We think, well, you know, I'm righteous. I keep the commandments, so I'm going to be saved. And that nasty guy over there that's a, a pervert and a murderer and an adulterer and whatever, he's not going to be saved. But that's not what this says. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we keep seeing this qualifier in here, right? That you need to believe in Jesus in, in order to be saved. So... I started to think about these things and I actually started to look for other scriptures because, you know, if you, if you find one scripture and it says something, but you don't find any other scriptures to back it up, you might be misinterpreting the scripture. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking around and I'd like you to take you next to first Timothy two verse four. It's a little, it takes me a little while because I'm going back and forth here. I left. I leave my paper Bible in one paper Bible in Costa Rica and one paper Bible in Alaska. So I'm in Wisconsin. I don't have my paper Bible with me. So I'm <laughs> using my iPad. <laughs> so First Timothy. Did I say First Timothy? What did I say? Mm -hmm. 2 verse 4, or 4 verse 2. That I don't remember. I got to go back. It's 2 verse 4. 2 verse 4, okay. See, it's, it's a good idea to use a paper Bible. Okay. But we, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts, for neither at any time, wait a minute, this is not right. Yes, that's what's wrong, I believe. First Timothy two, verse four. 
That's where we want to be. First Timothy. I'm in Thessalonians. Yeah, it's make not a good. Yeah, it'd make a bit of a difference. Yeah. Do we have a paper Bible around here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So here's another verse that says God will ha to have all men be saved. It doesn't say some men. It doesn't say a few men. It doesn't say just those guys who thinks that they're righteous because they keep the commandments, but it says, who will have all men to be saved? Okay. Well, some people would say to me, well, maybe it's not his will that all men be saved, or maybe his will won't come true. King James River. There we go. So if you, if you look at it that way, okay, you can say, well, you know, it's it's his will that all men be saved, but that not doesn't necessarily mean all people will be saved. But I would ask you this question: Do you not believe that our Father is omnipotent? Mm -hmm. Is he not in charge of everything and everybody? And so, if you read this and you realize it's his will that all men be saved, why would you not think that his will would not come true. And so when I read the scripture, I thought, yeah, I've been reading this scripture and I've been putting the same thing in there. Mm -hmm. It's his will that some of us will be saved, but it doesn't say that. Oh. Right. And so some of you might be saying, oh, now you're preaching universal salvation. Well, if you, if you want to say that, in the strict sense of the meaning of universal salvation, that's true, but it's not the same as what the world teaches. And there are churches that teach universal salvation, but they teach salvation. And there's also churches that teach, you know, predestination. Okay. So I'm not teaching predestination in the sense of a Baptist would define predestination. But I am saying that you are predestined to become a son of God. Will he fail? Will he fail with any human being? I don't think so. And that's kind of a, a maybe for some of you, a kind of a shocking statement because the first thing that happens when I talk to people about this is they go, that's not fair. I'm a good guy and Hitler was a very bad, bad dude. You're telling me that he's going to be saved too? That's not fair. But God is not a respecter of persons, is he? He doesn't care what we think is fair or not fair. Let's let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15 because there's a, some very interesting statements there. 1 Corinthians 15. I won't go to Colossians this time. I'll go to Corinthians. <laughs> so if we go to 1 Corinthians 15, and we start in verse 20, it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. So there, there is an order here. For since by man came death, Okay, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, a few die. Oops, here we come to that word all again. Mm -hmm. Because it says, for in Adam, all die. And we know that. Have you, do, does anybody know of anybody that hasn't died eventually? Every man dies, right? 
as in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ, shall all be made alive. Here's another scripture that says, we are all die, and in Christ, we're all going to be made alive. So we have that qualifier here again too, right? In other words, you have to believe in Jesus in order to be part of the people made alive, right? So, but every man in his own order. Ah, here's something very interesting. Okay, Christ the first fruits, which we know we read up in the verse, previous verse. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. So there's an order to this. Then come in the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So if Jesus destroys death, how can anybody die? Because if, if one person ends up being eternally destroyed, like we've been taught, then he didn't conquer death, did he? In order to conquer death, you have to put death under your feet. In other words, death has to not exist. And so for him to put death under his feet, he, it can't be that some people are going to die. It's an interesting concept. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And you can continue reading on here. The rest of the chapter is very interesting and very in-depth. You know, we read, we read the, the verse that says, you know, we should sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, okay, so we kind of interpret that to mean, oh, the saints. But what should we have hope about? Do we need to have hope that someone who is a saint is going to be resurrected? No. What we need to have is hope that the people who are not saints, our relatives, our friends, our neighbors, who do not keep the commandments, who do not follow God's law, who do not do things now, those are the people that we need to have hope for. We kind of interpret that scripture that we need to have hope that we should not sorrow about one of our brethren dying. You know, But who are our brethren? Every human being that ever walked. Go to Genesis. God created all men in his image. Not some. Not a few, but all. And so, you know, these are some of the problems we face in this world. We have people who have different colored skin. We have people who have different ethnicity. You have people who have different cultures. And so we have a tendency to look down on them and say, well, they're not like us. And so we can treat them differently, can't we? But that's not what God said, did he? All men are created equal in his image. And so... You know, if you have black skin or you have red skin or you have yellow skin or you have white skin, it doesn't really matter. You're in the image of him. That image is a mental image. It's not a physical image. Because we 
have the mind of God. We rejected that mind when Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but his son came to, dis to restore that. And when he does, and when he did restore that, then that allowed a new gateway for us to what? Get eternal life. And for death to be put under his feet. There's also some very interesting scriptures that I found that um, show some things that are very interesting, like Job 23, 13. Let's go there, because we noticed that one of the qualifiers was the will of God. So Job 23, verse 13. And this is just one of many scriptures. Twenty-three, thirteen, and it says, but he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desires, even that he does. So if he desires, like he says in Timothy, that all men be saved, it says right here, but he is of one mind, and who can turn him? Who can turn his mind, who can? Nobody. We can be turned, can't we? Mm -hmm. By Satan. But God cannot be turned. And what his soul desires, even that he does. For he performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many things are with him. You see? And if he appointed you to be saved, to be one of his children in the kingdom, then he's going to do that. And no one's going to turn him away from that. Satan certainly tries every day and in every way, doesn't he? He does a lot of his trying through religion. <laughs> you have to be very careful what you, who you listen to and what you believe because religion has a certain tendency to lead you astray. Isaiah 55, 11. Let's go there. Isaiah 55, 11. I'll be more careful and hit the right numbers. Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that it shall not be cut off. There is another scripture that tells you what he wills is what happens. And when he, and if, he predestined you to be saved, to be part of his kingdom. If he did that, then that is going to happen. There's no question about it. It's going to happen because it's his will. He so loved the world that he sent his only son so that the world through him might be saved. There, there are so many scriptures that say that he's going to save everybody. There's at least a hundred of them that I found. I couldn't even possibly begin to bring them all to you tonight. But I would challenge you to go into your own Bible and start looking for these scriptures. I found at least 
a hundred scriptures that say he's going to save everybody. One of the ones that we, Isaiah 23, verse 45, let's go there. But one of the most, one of the most familiar scriptures that you can remember, Isaiah 23, I wrote that down. It's Isaiah 45, 23. I remember that. I wrote that backwards. Okay. See, that's what happens when you get old and dyslectic. Oh, well, we already went to 45, 23, didn't we? No. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. And it's just the saying what Job's, what it said in Job and what it said in Isaiah before we read. It, it doesn't change. It doesn't, he doesn't change. His, his program hasn't changed from the time he created Adam. That unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. So now we go back to that qualifier, right? The qualifier was what? You have to confess Jesus, right? And so what is this scripture saying? Unto me, every knee shall bow. And it doesn't say just some knees are going to bow, but every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say in the Lord, I have righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. You can go back to that scripture in Romans. All Israel will be saved. And, and look at the, the, when we read the story of the, of the dry bones being resurrected, right? Okay, because now people ask me this question. Well, what about the lake of fire? And people are thrown into this lake of fire, right? Revelation. Mm -hmm. But when you read the story of the dry bones, what is it? It's Israel being what? Physically resurrected. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many times can you be resurrected? How many times will some people need to be resurrected? <laughs> See, because we, we have this idea in our head, well, there's only two resurrections, right? Well, what if you, what if, so, you know, we know that people were resurrected from death back to life, right? The people who were resurrected when Yeshua died, when Jesus died, right? What happened? People were resurrected, right, in Jerusalem, and people saw him walking around. They went, hey, man, you've been dead for 20 years. What are you doing here? Well, if one of those people were to fall into perdition, right, then, would the, would, then they would not be resurrected again. So how many resurrections is that for them? You see what I'm saying? It would be three. According to Kabbalah, it just goes on until you're ready. Well, if you, yeah, if you want to call this Kabbalah, I call it reading the Bible. <laughs> but yeah, it's, so what I'm saying is, and so that that's another thing. Okay, so here we have the lake of fire, right? You need to go back and study Gehenna and Gehenna fire because that's where that statement comes from. Okay, and so if you go back and study Gehenna fire, it wasn't eternal fire. In fact, at the time of Jesus, it already had gone out. But back in the time of Israel, they had a place where they threw everything, and it was, was just there. It was just there, right? It was burning. But was it eternal? Is it burning right now? Because if it was an eternal fire, it would be burning still, wouldn't it? Now it's landscaped and paved. And yeah, <laughs> right. So you've been there. <laughs> it's not burning anymore. But the point of this is, what does fire represent in the Bible? 
what does fire Virgin represent? Refining. It re represents cleansing and refining, right? And what does a sinner need? He needs fire. He needs cleansing. He needs refining. And so we look at the lake of fire statement in Revelation as a physical thing. Like we're going to pick up this human being and toss him into this burning fire. Which one of your children would you toss into a burning fire? There's some other people's children that might. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, think about this. We have a loving, merciful father, right? Is he going to eternally toss one of his children into a burning fire? But which one of your children would not you reprimand and punish for a deed done wrong? And why would you punish your child? So they wouldn't do it again. Because they could be doing irreparable harm to themselves, right? So if you see your child going to put his hand on the wood stove, what do you do? You say, hey, don't do that. Or you may even punish him for doing it because you know that if he puts his hand on that wood stove, he's going to burn himself. And so just like any good father would do in this world today, we would reprimand and guide our children. And so our heavenly father is doing the same thing here. He's not literally throwing in people into this fire. He's reprimanding them because they are sinners. And he wants them to change. How many times is Hitler going to have to be thrown into the fire before he changes? I don't know. He could repent immediately. And he wouldn't have to go through that again. But he might be the kind of person that just doesn't see the light right away. And so he may have to be punished over and over we also read in scripture that, and it says if you sow something you reap it if you sow evil you will reap evil if you sow good and you're a child of the light you will reap light and so pete there are people in this world who do nothing but sow evil there's some really evil people in this world in fact right now we're experiencing a, a resurgence of evil in this world like we haven't seen i haven't seen in my lifetime where is what's that going what's the result of that going to be well hopefully people that are not evil that are good people can push back at that enough to push the evil back down again. you know that's our responsibility we're to live the kingdom now it's our responsibility to be the light to the world But when you talk about eternal lake of fire, it is eternal. You know, in other words, you're destined for eternal life. And so how many times are you going to go in the lake of fire? There's another scripture that we all know. And, you know, we've read this scripture over and over, particularly at feast time. And that is, of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. But the first thing we want to do is put an end to it. Right? We're all waiting for the end. But in that scripture, it says, of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And we go to Revelation New kingdom, new heaven, new earth, and what do we see? Physical people. Did it end? Because, you know, when, when I grew up, I was taught, oh, well, when new heaven, new earth, that's it. No more physical people. That's the end. But I was not reading the scripture that says, of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. I don't know. That's really kind of a simple statement. It just says it's going to keep going and going and going and more people are going to be born. You ever wonder, you know, like in the millennium, you, you would, I would think, oh man, you know, in the millennium, there's going to be more people born. 
What's going to happen to them? And then we read about the 100-year period of time, and, and you say, well, yeah, but there's going to be more people born in the 100-year time, right? That's how God created men. He created men to procreate. <laughs> we, we never stop doing that. And so if it says of the increase of his government, well, how does government increase? More people. And so I keep reading all of these scriptures. Like I said, there's at least 100 scriptures that say, there's three times in the Bible it says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Not just once. It says it three times. You can go find the other two times yourself. But they're there. It says it three times. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Can I bring up a definitional point from the Hebrew? Mm -hmm. uh, in the Hebrew, the word yasha, you know, being saved, which is a root word for Yeshua. Yep, he is salvation. The, it's usually refer, referring to a, a, a deliverance, a healing, uh, and it virtually never refers to eternal life. And Whereas in our modern English, if we talk about someone being saved, it's that they're going to be in heaven, you know, eternal life. And, and that's a big disconnect in language. Mm -hmm. So we read saved and we think going, you know, to heaven or whatever. Right. But in the Hebrew, it doesn't mean that. Uh, it refers to, like, say, if... Uh, we're talking about Ezekiel 37. They'll be restored to life. You know, that's the salvation being restored to physical life. Or every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, receive the Holy Spirit. That receiving the Holy Spirit is salvation. Uh, but that, when I was studying this a number of years ago, and that's why I really like to go back and read the whole thing you know, with the original Hebrew to understand any New Testament verse in the Greek is to go back to the Hebrew and, you know, put it all in context. And so it would be a mistake to see where it's talking about everybody being saved or, you know, someone being saved to connect that to being a resurrected spirit being. It's a disconnect. So, you know, so first of all, I, you know, disconnect the word saved having to do with being resurrected or eternal life, because it generally never refers to that unless it's in the context, like the Apostle Paul talks about it being in the context of eternal life. Mm -hmm. So unless it's talking about the subject of eternal life or the resurrection, saved never means eternal life. It just means being delivered from a situation. And, uh, but it does mean being restored. Yes. So, and so I would say to you that the original restoration project goes all the way back to Adam. Well, yes. And that's where we get now. So it says, every knee will bow, every tongue confess. It says, everybody will be receiving the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. But then now how do you read uh, uh, Hebrews 6, verse 3? Well, let's go there. Okay. Hebrews chapter 6. I'd like to remind everybody that if you have a comment, you can uh, turn on your camera and we'll know you have something to say. Or you can go into chat room and just type, hey, I got my two cents worth to put in here. And then going into four. Uh, right, this is a very, this is a very difficult scripture. 
to explain. Not really. But if you understand the word restoration and you understand the ultimate plan that God had for Adam and all mankind was, was to not need restoration. And so Jesus is the restorer yeah. back to what? What did Adam have before he ate of the tree? He had life eternal, didn't he? No. He couldn't die. He couldn't eat of the tree. He had not eaten of the tree. Right. So he didn't have eternal. He, when he was created, though, he hadn't he had eaten potential. of the tree. He right. had the potential for eternal life. Yeah. So when, so when it's God's plan to restore, and if you want to use the word saved, or you can insert the word restore, back to the original, you would be restoring back to before Adam ate right. of the tree. Yes, but see, that's the, the thing is that, you know, I guess the, the worldwide church of God was unique in believing in a resurrection to a physical life and receiving the Holy Spirit, that all mankind would receive the Holy Spirit at some point right. that that was God's plan for all of mankind that nobody would not receive the Holy Spirit. And, and that was a unique doctrine. And as much as my father was against Herbert Armstrong, he firmly believed that one doctrine mm -hmm. as opposed to everybody else in Christendom. There was only one church that taught that everybody would receive the Holy Spirit was the Worldwide Church of God, at least, you know, in our lifetimes. Right. And that people would be resurrected. Now, we're talking, say, uh, those churches that believe in Jesus because the Jewish Kabbalah believes in infinite resurrections to perfection uh, without needing the sacrifice of Christ, of course, that that's just God's plan is to keep resurrecting people until they've overcome everything. And, uh, you know, which is opposed to Hindu, which believes you can come back as an animal or an insect. Right. You know, so the Jewish religion believes in multiple resurrections and that's even the Orthodox Judaism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, without a need for someone to pay for your sins, you just, you know, live multiple lives until you overcome all of your sins is how the Jewish people believe it. Right. And I'm not saying the Bible supports that. Right. Right. Uh, but the, it would be a mistake to, to think that the word saved means eternal life because it very rarely does unless it's in context of that. It usually just mm -hmm. means a, a restoration. So that's the thing that in the Worldwide Church of God we were very unique on is believing that every human who ever lived, even every aborted fetus or every, you know, right. miscarriage. Every conception of life. Yes, that would be resurrected and given the Holy Spirit and that the child that was just born from, you know, being aborted would live the 100 years as well as the old man who died a natural death would live 100 years. And so... And that's kind of a, a... There's really only one scripture in the whole Bible that alludes to that 100-year period. And that's questionable, period. yes. And it's questionable in my mind but, that that but, even exists. But we're talking about the concept that every living human being was intended to receive the Holy Spirit. Right. And that's the thing is in Hebrews 6, it says that if a person has tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers, you know, of the coming age, in other words, has received the Holy Spirit, but of their own free choice rejects it, that would be the only way a person could lose eternal life is by through free moral agency. Uh, blaspheming the Holy Spirit without repentance. Right, and there's there's other scriptures that talk about that, but they also imply, and I would contend with you that in the Greek, we're talking here of ages or eons, not 
a eternal thing because the concept of eternal in the new testament doesn't exist it's an age well see that that's the thing is uh, the, the difference between say us as uh, resurrected spirit beings is that we will be immortal but to be eternal that means you'll have to have lived for eternity in the past so well you can never be eternal but only god right. is eternal right which is implied in the name you know the yhvh is the root and the added you know uh syllable which shows past present and future existence right. self-directing you know so the difference that we have say as the children of God is that we had a beginning now again the Jewish people don't believe we ever had a beginning we well, just I, are going I through. think we, we had a beginning <laughs> yeah <laughs> right but if you talk to a Jewish rabbi you right. would have had many beginnings right. previously that's Jewish Kabbalism no that's Orthodox Judaism Kabbalah I think the See, the Orthodox Judaism doesn't take it to perfection, whereas, you know, the Kabbalah, they take it to perfection. Mm -hmm. You go through multiple lives until you're, you know, perfect, r risen up spiritually to the point where you don't need to die and, and be recycled again. All right. Well, that's, I don't think that's what he's saying and we need to. Well, but I'm, I'm just saying comparative, but see, I, from a comparative religion point of view, we have been the only group of people that believe that every human being who ever received life would receive the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is that from the strict definition of the Hebrew, that's as far as salvation takes us. And then from there, it becomes eternal life. Mm -hmm. You know, that the salvation doesn't refer to immortality. It refers to a restoration and a healing, which receiving the Holy Spirit takes us to that point. But now I would maintain, you know, based upon the places that I've read, which is, again, more places, is that we would have that choice. In other words, we would, if we're incorrigibly, you know, opposed to our Father in Heaven, uh, we won't be forced to be reborn and reborn and reborn and reborn until we accept him. And now, another interesting thing Judaism has is that uh, an essential part of being, you know, reincarnated is that we cannot remember the past; that we get a fresh new start with our with a new mind, a new consciousness, mm -hmm. which they feel is essential for the purification. In other words, we don't carry any baggage over. But see, from that same point of view, uh, I, I believe I could make a case that a, the human has a free moral agency to be incorrigibly evil if we choose. I would disagree with that. Right. That's uh, I, I'm trying to get it right to that point. Right. Where, uh, I, of, you know, I disagree with that, and I and I think that from the beginning Yahweh predestined us to be one of his children and be part of the kingdom. And yes. that, that that is his will, that was his will from the beginning, and he is going to see that fulfilled. Which that is a very popular point of view. Uh, uh, I have a brother that holds to that point of view, mm -hmm. and uh, it's commonly known as Calvinism. That's well, very... Calvinism is different because Calvinism says you're either predestined to go to heaven or you're predestined to go to hell. Right. But That's they do different. make the point that if you are predestined, which we would all agree that we're all predestined to receive the Holy Spirit. Right. And, and that would put us with the path to heaven, we would say. Okay. To the kingdom, let's so we would say disagree heaven. with John Calvin kingdom. on the point right. that there is people that will not receive and couldn't and couldn't right, and uh, so and he would put us to the stake and burn us for that opinion. Well, but he's uh, not alive uh, anymore. <laughs> well, no, see, he was one that would have been put to the stake because he was a heretic, you mm -hmm. know, in his day. But 
but then the, the again a long time opposing point of view is that people have and so this debate has been going on actually for at least 500 years that we're talking mm -hmm. about and right, at least since the reformation at least since the reformation people have actively been debating this because the orthodox and the roman catholic church have their own different point of view right but uh uh but you know since the reformation people have been debating it and kind of going back and forth so i accept that it's a debatable issue and, and would not say that you know there aren't scriptures supporting what you would say but then on the other hand another point of view is that we were we are reincarnated angels and that's supposedly all in the hebrew according to you know mm -hmm. the people that believe that and that it's we're the process of the angels being restored in other words the angels that preceded us were us in a previous life and that went through a rebellion and we're in the process of being restored and uh so we well, there's, them, a lot, they are us. there's a lot of viewpoints on that. Yes. I understand that because yes. I have read most of them. Yes. But it's my opinion yes. that those viewpoints are not exactly true. Right. There isn't a whole lot of substantiation for the fact that we are fallen angels being restored. Right. And part of that, I would say, is well then what are we, why are we experiencing demons and angels now if we're the being we're the angels being restored oh no we're the we're the that those are the hitlers <laughs> that oh, were recycled okay. to be, you know <laughs> still in the process <laughs> right I, I would not find a lot of scriptural support for that and i know you don't no know it, but no. i'm just saying when i read that theory i kind of went mm, i don't see a lot of scripture that supports that well there's a scripture too it talks about don't you know for you shall judge angels right so yeah how does that fit in for the angel judging the angels who are the angels who are it just doesn't that just right doesn't i mean die. i just you know. <laughs> yeah but now on, on the other hand i remember a number of sermons in the worldwide church of god speculating that the increase that would be without end would be that say, you know, our batch of humans would receive mm -hmm. immortality, but then there would be future batches uh, throughout the universe uh, yet to come. Right. And that was a very commonly held right. opinion as a speculation, not as a doctrine, but as a speculation by, you know, quite a I few found years. it incongruous in the Worldwide Church of God doctrine that some people would be eternally destroyed. And yet there's a lot of scriptures that go against that idea that people will be eternally destroyed and so that really is where i came to say wait a minute is our people going to be eternally destroyed and you know in the worldwide church of god it was alluded well 144,000 will be saved and everyone out the billions will be destroyed you know well that would be the extreme uh that was an extreme of, polarity of, right two, two right. small groups right right, right. but it was uh, but the idea of the you know immortality of the soul which is basically what you're saying right is uh that that's uh what we're talking about and uh so yeah there's a lot of opinions and uh you know and, and you know based upon my study of the same thing i, I find some, several scriptures that say not only the incorrigible uh humans but will, the incorrigible angels angels will right. cease to exist they will not mm -hmm. uh be around that yeah. could be true yeah i mean we don't know well yeah this is all kind of speculative but i think we all agree with what you're saying is that every living human whether you know beyond the point of conception of you know becoming a, an actual uh human being 
at whichever minute or hour that that happens you know in the right process. and that's debatable but yeah mm -hmm. but you know, that you know at, when is life start yeah is debatable right so john merritt wrote a book on that yeah 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 and, and i mean but i think it's just within days after conception that it's life absolutely right absolutely yeah. right yeah and 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 that everybody will receive the holy spirit mm -hmm. and that i agree with 100 percent. right mm -hmm. but then we can then know, we differ a little bit from that point well th again that that there's uh scriptures that leave room for a little bit of movement both ways mm -hmm. and, and and so we're speculating in the sense right because there are there's scripture there's a scripture that says you know narrow is the gate yeah and you know few that find that yes but you know i i read that scripture and i said well i think that's referring to now yes not I would agree. Not yeah, in not time. once everybody has the spirit. I yeah. you know then the gate is no longer narrow. Now well, that, that's about the millennium. Also, is that everybody, right. every human being, will receive the Holy Spirit right. in the millennium? I, I think it, we're we're kind of drifting here, but uh -huh. are we? Yeah, yeah it's just slightly. But he's yeah. the one that's the presenter. If he thinks yeah. we're not. So no, no, the whole the whole thing too is timing, and what are you being saved for, or what are you striving for? Because there was another set of goods that was presented that the entire world is in category saved. They're just the worker bees kind of guys or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there was category A, where you're seeking a better resurrection to be part of the government, part of the leadership, part of the people doing the healing. So, you know, there's, kind of a there's that in there, there too. That's definitely a joke. Right. Well, I'm just saying, you know, know, there's that thinking too. Yeah. Right. Is that and that's there's in the two. But I, I think I addressed that in the beginning when I said all men are created equal. Yeah, in the image of Yahweh. Yeah, and because see, I, there, there are groups that that teach that that the hundred forty four thousand in the first resurrection are special, are, are a special category, and the rest might even just be living like humans. I, like I do think this. people who are given the Holy Spirit now in this point in time are a special people in the sense that we're special amongst the people we're amongst now. Mm -hmm. because they don't have the spirit and so that makes us different in a sense of you know we we have an understanding that we need to pay attention to not just go yeah. off and do but whatever there's no we caste want system in the no yeah and i i was i thought i was kind of clear on that yeah. in the beginning and i'm saying there is no difference <laughs> no, <it's laughs> you know? good to, because right. there are people amongst us that believe that yeah I know I yeah. I've met them and you know especially <laughs> if you meet a Jewish rabbi and you sit down an Orthodox Jewish rabbi he thinks he's pretty special mm -hmm. and he's yes. got it all over the rest of us yeah so, it's an error that they promote. Right. it's an error they promote it's an error that people promote in in the whole world I mean I mean I I've done a lot of traveling there's a lot of places you go where the caste system is horrible Mm -hmm. you know and it is you know in america we think well black people are you know put upon and they are to a certain extent but not to the extent of people in india i mean i have a friend in india who runs a home for boys okay and he bought those boys and put them in the home hmm. because they were boys that were born from the sex trade mm. okay and they were either going to be killed okay or they would be have no life but just abject poverty and they and they put those children up for sale and he bought 50 of them and put them in a home to give them a better life mm -hmm. you see that's a, an extreme example of the caste system you want to go somewhere where there's a big caste system go to india and yeah. you will see it's not 
anything like here. And it has nothing to do with the color of their skin. It's just how they were born. Yeah. You know, and so it's a, it's a horrible thing to even contemplate. I mean, <laughs> it sounds bad. Oh, I bought these children. <laughs> well, I bought these children to save them from death. Mm -hmm. Because they're unwanted. Right. You know. That's a sad thing. It is a sad thing. But it's true in this world. We mm -hmm. see a lot of discrimination, a lot of people who think they're better than others. And if we take that idea and we move it forward into the kingdom what do we got we got more evil because that's an evil idea i i still would like to hear an alternative explanation of hebrews three four five okay six. well that's a hard scripture for me to explain i know i've, I've had that brought up more than once <laughs> and so um hebrews is a very difficult book there's some things in Hebrews that go the other way that are difficult to explain too. <laughs> have you ever read it in Aramaic or Hebrew? I have an, I, I have it in Aramaic. And I don't read Aramaic, but I have an English translation of the Aramaic New mm -hmm. Testament, you know, from the Targums. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a good idea to have an Aramaic translation of mm -hmm. the New Testament because it's less adulterated than... Mm -hmm. um, other translations because it didn't go into the Latin and then back to the English. Yes. And so, um, yeah, the earlier ones go back like 250. And actually, I should actually go read that in Hebrews and see what that has to say mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I haven't done it. But, but anyway, For I. Further discussions. So yeah, so right. Yeah, so <laughs> in fact, I'm going to go do that <laughs> because I'm going to try to answer that question. <laughs> in a future program right <laughs> there there's a couple other difficult scriptures that you go well wait a minute now why does it say this you know and so um, I, you know i mean no matter what subject that i study in the bible you know i come across difficult scriptures I've actually uh, discussed this subject with Mark Kaplan, who's, mm -hmm. you know, a <laughs> little anecdote. I, the first Bible What does I he took, think, by the way? I'll give you the anecdote first. Okay. I'll lead up to it. <laughs> I, I, I made the mistake of bringing down a translation called The Scriptures. Yes, I have that translation. He almost kicked me out of the room. Really? Because that is such a bad translation. That's not such a bad translation. It is. It's terrible. And uh, he pointed it out to me. Yeah. Why? And, I mean, it's just a terrible translation. But by the end of the feast, I got my point through that I just brought it down. I, I wasn't, uh, you know, a Yahweh sacred names person. Right. That... I just wanted, I knew some other people that were and wanted to get his opinion. So once he realized that I wasn't, you know, of that category, he actually apologized to me, you know, for, uh, for doing that to me, you might say. But he didn't want that Bible in the room. It's such a bad translation. I find it to be very useful translation in the sense that it always tells me who's talking. Nope. That's where it's really wrong. And uh, so he kind of showed me the key, you know, how to go through. And he showed me the pointers, you know, so I could go back and I found, yeah, it's bad. And uh, so next time I didn't make that mistake. I mm -hmm. brought down my Aramaic Bible, my new Aramaic New Testament. Yeah. And he saw it there. He was a very curious person. He picked it up and started reading it to me and showing me things in the Aramaic. He reads mm -hmm. the Aramaic as well as the Hebrew. And uh, so with that point made, uh, he does believe that Satan will be extinguished mm -hmm. and, and that the incorrigible humans will be extinguished. Mm -hmm. And uh, But 
that would be something to, you know, right. ask them, well, show me specifically. Why? Because I showed right? him the scriptures, why I thought so. And he agreed that those are the same scriptures that he used, mm -hmm. which are, you know, Old Testament and New Testament. And, uh, but I realize the other point of view, so I'm not going to be condemning to anybody right. of the other point of view because, I mean. We might all be surprised. Right. <laughs> it is a little speculative. Right. right. Oh, it is. Yeah. yeah. No doubt. We know we're here to produce the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Right. Us now, you know, that's our task. Right. And, and that's where we should be focused. And, and uh, but, uh, but yeah, that when you, you get into the Hebrew, under, truly understanding the Hebrew, and that's why I want to learn Hebrew. Uh, I'm not fluent, but I can read it and, mm -hmm. you know, do the Bible study with it. That, uh, but that still, I mean, it, it's, there's just so deep on the Hebrew. Uh, you were talking about the um, how the translation to, to um, Aramaic. <laughs> I had someone bring an Aramaic Bible one night, and I'm looking at it. It says, "Translated from original script to English, then to Aramaic, then back to English." So it's, you got to be careful where you're getting your Aramaic Bibles from. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are a translation of a translation of a translation. And they're not actually from Aramaic script. Right? Yes, uh, the Kiburis, uh is There's... translation from a text that was, oh, was you know, several hundred years ago, mm -hmm. say, say about you know, well, a thousand years ago, twelve hundred years, twelve hundred A.D. That it was transcribed directly from a text that dated one fifty A.D. Right. So, uh, which is way older than our New Testament text. Right. Well, the now another point, and I, I, there was a, a, a guy from Cyprus when I was in Jerusalem gave an excellent uh, talk, and the point that the Greeks make is the church in Corinth is the same church that was there in Corinth back at the time of Paul. Mm -hmm. You know, they're still Greeks, and they're still using the same Bible. So they, the Greeks view it that they, they have never had another Bible. Text. They, because every generation in Corinth had a Bible. There was not a time when there wasn't a church in Corinth. Mm -hmm. And now I would maintain that they've made a few changes through the years. <laughs> but the, the, the idea to the Greeks that there's other texts other than the Greek is a little bit preposterous to them because they feel that they have the same Bible. In other words, there is never a generation missed. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, so, or you would find out. So, are they using the Septuagint? Uh, yes. For the Old Testament? They believe in using the Septuagint because that's in their language. Right. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and, and so they're not Hebrew speakers. They're Greek speakers. Right. And, and it's the, what I found about the Septuagint, it's a paraphrase. Mm -hmm. It's thought by thought, not word for word. It can't be word for word no. because it's not word for word. Right. <laughs> so. so yeah. If there's anybody else out there that's got any ideas and thoughts, I'm uh, seeing we're kind of floating Off around. Topic? Oh yeah, Did Mark no, we're still on the topic. We're still on the topic. We're oh. just kind of drifting Did through definition. Um, feel free to type in the chat room. Turn on your camera. Say hello, or just turn on your mic. Um, I what I will do right now. I've got everybody muted, so I will. So we don't even know if they were trying to talk. To yeah, us. I just realized that I muted everybody because we had some people. Aside. We had some people that. <laughs> Yeah, Lauren is still in the ocean. So Lauren is going to remain muted. <laughs> Everyone else, you are now unmuted. Um, you can please mute your mic. That's on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. If you don't want to speak, mute your mic. If you do want to speak, go ahead and unmute it. Go ahead. Well, everyone is unmuted. 
So, um, open to comments. If anyone has a comment or something they'd like to say or add in. Still processing. I'll, I'll process or throw something in there. We're talking, you were talking about the um, eternal fire, so to speak, but, and, and you did bring up the point that I think I agreed with you as far as this. I, I liken it. I think it was, oh, forgive me. I can't remember the Native, Native American chief that when they were being basically chased out of way, the, the trail of tears kind of thing, I believe is his, his famous quote was, I will fight them all forever. And that doesn't mean that he's going to fight forever. He's, you know, that's, that means that he's, he's not going to fight anymore at all after this. And so that's kind of the same thing, kind of, kind of, kind of goes together with the eternal, with the, or getting rid of that eternal fire, hellfire, because they're not going to burn forever. So it's it basically like saying they will burn no more forever. They will, they will be basically, I guess you could say d destroyed is a strong word, but they will be cast Erased. into the lake of fire and they will be, be instantly d d you know, done with, and that's it. They'll never be there again. They'll never happen again. They'll never be anywhere forever after that. So it's a finality. It's not a, a continuous thing. It's a finality. Does that make sense? It's an erasure. I that's where I disagree, because I believe that the lake of fire is not literal, but it's figurative. Just like ninety nine percent of the rest of the book of Revelation is figurative and not literal. Another disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't think we're going to see a woman riding around on a dragon. Well, but we, but we do hear, but we do hear about a new heaven and a new earth. You know, and that um, is it in Peter where everything melts with a fervent heat. Because I, I joke with my liberal friends, that's the global warming that I believe in. Um, <laughs> and. I you know, it it's it can go both ways. Um, I I really and truly believe in a God of mercy and love, and that you know, Mark, I, I like where this is going. But if there is the possibility that there's a person that just you know, just like a, a horse that's lame, sometimes the best thing to do is to put them out of their misery. Um, and it's a merciful act. It's not that you hate the person or, or whatever it might be. And, I, and I'm not saying that uh, um, that's going to be a lot of people. I'm not saying it's going to be one. I don't know. I mean, that's ultimately up to the, the father. Um, but I still look at it as, as an act of mercy, not an act of revenge or anger. Um, and I, and I like the verses about, you know, changing the person's heart and, um uh, believing that anybody can be redeemed and, but there's still that that other possibility that uh you know what if what if there is that one person that just decides that uh you know um maybe it was Dennis Ramlow who kept bringing this up during your discussion um maybe maybe you're both right you know there is this possibility and, and I don't even want to consider it that there would be people that would want to reject uh, God even after they having their hearts softened and everything else uh, but the one thing I cling to in all of this you know rather than getting um, wrapped up in controversy is that and I, I know God's loving and merciful father and I, my ways are not necess not his ways, and I hope them to be, and I work towards them to be that. Uh, but I, I'm okay, you know. I'm okay either way. But I still believe in that whole merciful, loving Father, and however things bear out, is is fine by me. 
and I, I know that it sounds wishy-washy, but uh, it is I, a very speculative subject. It, it is, and I've I've heard horrible, horrible eighth day sermons, um, especially not long after having lost my mother, um, that just just tore me apart and um you know and the only thing that the person could say to me afterwards well what did your mom wh what do you think your mom did that was so horrible that that she wouldn't be brought back and i'm just like that's not the point i mean the point is the message that you were giving was one that there was no hope yes i remember that, that uh, right peggy is saying yeah she remembered that you Peggy knows exactly the the person who gave that message yeah. and and the the time of which I'm speaking and it, it was just it was horrible because that's it's just like that's not that's not the God I know um, I think Lauren's trying to talk <laughs> yeah Lauren I had to meet you again because the CD is just too overwhelming sorry yeah. Anyway, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a good place now, and, uh, you know, about the government increasing, yeah, I, I totally get that. It just, it's the only thing that makes sense. Um, you know, the mercy and love, uh, I'll just, I'd rather err on the side of mercy and love and, and, and think that, you know, everyone will be saved. Uh, but at the same time, I'm 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 okay with there being a lake of fire because you know maybe there is. Uh, that's also an act of mercy in another way. Um, so. Right, and also if you go to the scriptures on the lake of fire, in Revelation, it really never says that. It says that Satan is cast into the lake of fire. Yeah. And the beast. And the beast. And the, and the false prophet. And the false prophet. Which are, I said, okay. But it never prophet, says beast, yeah, okay. half the humanity is cast into the lake of fire. Oh, <laughs> here. That was also a common belief that, you know, practically everybody would come around. Right. But there would be a few. A few. And that could be. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just saying we need to not despair about relatives who were not believers right. and people who maybe we thought were believers and fell away you know, and, oh, oh now they're condemned to the lake of fire because they kept the sabbath for 20 years and now they don't keep the sabbath. oh well right and, I, and and we're on that same page i mean um lauren can you mute your mic uh i just had an uncle who committed suicide a week ago and we're we're still trying to process that um, but again, it's, it's like the thing that gets you through it is knowing that, uh, God is merciful and God's full of love and, and he has a plan for him. And he has a plan, <laughs> you know, and, and like, like Sarah, uh, who, uh, didn't really get into the whole plan of things. And she figured, well, she gave, um, Hagar to, uh, Abraham, she'd get a son by, by Hagar. Um, you know, God's got his plans, and you know, all that we can really do is muck it up. Um, but in the long run, it's all going to work out. And um, and even even Yahweh even blessed Hagar, and he did. Yeah. He did. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I remembered one of the passages and why uh, Mark Kaplan feels that Satan will be destroyed. Mm -hmm. it's Ezekiel, I'm of the opinion that Satan will be destroyed. Okay. Yeah, because Ezekiel 28, it talks, starts right. about the prince of Tyre, who's a human. The king of Tyre is where it goes on that, you know, you were the carob, the covering carob. Right. And that's where the pronoun changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 19, it says, and uh, that you shall never be anymore. And, you know, right. talking about the king of Tyre, and then it goes to Sidon. 
you know, from there. Mm -hmm. So that's where Mark Kaplan felt he feels, you know, that's one of the scriptures, but it says definitely there that the, that uh, King of Tyre, which is you see from the context, it's referring to Satan, right? That he will disappear. Right. You always have to watch those pronouns when you're doing Bible study. Yes. Yeah, we went through that very <laughs> thoroughly when the question came up several years back, and it, it definitely says in the Hebrew, you know, that it, it's definitely referring to not a man, but to the Caribs. Right. That's yeah. one of the reasons some of the big mistakes have been made in the Daniel prophecies. In chapter 9. Yes, actually. because they don't watch the pronoun, and all of a sudden they think they're talking. They're, they got Switch that. subject. Yep. And then it gets messed up, and then pretty soon we're predicting Yeshua will be here on Thursday, the 25th of May. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, that, that's something we talked about here quite a bit is about that the, uh, the Daniel 9 is not about nowadays. No, it was about the re first coming. About the first coming, right. and it was finished with the destruction of the temple. Right. And and that is clear if you keep the pronouns straight. And, and, and I think you were the one who discovered the order of the translation. It wasn't that when you see the abomination, it makes desolate. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be when you see the abomination that was made desolate. desolate. Yes. You know, there Christ was put on the cross. Right. He was made desolate. It's yeah. talking, he didn't change to some deeply like person that's going to take over. Right, yeah. well, you have to understand it's talking about him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it, because, yeah. right. But because the translator switched two mm -hmm. words, it muddied up that whole verse. Right. And, that, and then people think that it's a seven year tribulation because of Daniel 9. I know. And and, like, and, and, but Daniel 9. Uh, it, 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 pretty much all Bibles put that Matthew 24 is talking about Daniel 9, but it's really Daniel 11, verse 30 right. something that is quoting exactly. Right, okay. not Daniel. One thing that helps to understand the book of Revelation, too, is to realize that it all relates to the temple. And so when it says something in there, it's relating to something that took place in the temple. But the, the, the one thing, and I'm not trying to throw a wet blanket, um, and it's in Revelation 2015, and it says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Um, I know that that verse has been used many a time as a, uh, what was the thing in Worldwide? There's this third resurrection. Uh, that, was, that was one fallacy. Um, I think it's been used in other churches to say that you know there is a hell and people are going to burn up forever and ever um and just going back to what i mentioned before is it's it's a merciful it's a mercy killing if if needed you know I'm, and i'm not again i don't know where things are going to end up i know it's there it's there for a reason um but it's it's not up to me how how things end, and that's probably a good thing, because um, in the last couple of weeks I wanted to call fire down from heaven many a time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's some crazy stuff. Well, like Mark's saying, there's there's some evil. It's just manifesting. Um, just some horrible things happening. Right, and the other thing is when you read that in Revelation 20. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, you need to really carefully look at those words because we don't really understand what the book of life is. And I would say, I would refer you back again to Genesis and the creation because that's when life started. By the coffee pot. That's probably somebody calling because they can't. Yeah, it's Don Ross. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's your dad. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I just would caution the interpretation there in the English and the book of life. Yeah, what is the book of life? What is the book of life? 
because we're saying, well, if you're not found written in the book of life, well, if you are a human being, maybe you are in the book of life because you were created and given life. Yeah, the, the true universalist would say that Satan and all the demons will be reconciled. Yes. Well, and that's where I was saying, I believe Satan will be cast into the lake of fire, yeah. but not human beings. Yeah. Oh, but, okay. all right. you know, it, it, there's a lot of different interpretations. I mean, I yeah. was truly skimming the surface yeah, of a back. lot of different scriptures. Well, there's a few things I'm going to interrupt here. First of all, it talks about the Lamb's Book of Life. Right. Where is that in the Lamb's Book of Life? It also talks in Matthew about, for it is salvation is of Christ, of Jesus, of, of Yeshua. So it's through him. So it's his book. So he's doing the deciding, he's doing the, the work, and we're, or those who are with him will be supporting, helping to make this all happen, and he's fulfilling the will of the Father, who doesn't want anyone to perish. So this is a long process, and nowhere, and I may be wrong, I hope someone tells me wrong, nowhere do I see a time frame here. Right. It says all people in their order, in their time. Yeah. So how do we know that this whole salvational thing doesn't take a million years? Right. And God's got infinite patience. It could take a million years to I, turn somebody. I sat in a sermon so, in Jerusalem in the uh, Christ Church, in which it's an Anglican church, but they they let a lot of different people come in and rent the facility in the old city. And so we went there a couple times and heard different speakers. Well, there, uh, we were looking for the one group, but then a different group came in, more of young people, and started preaching that uh, the John Wesley sermon, you know, that, that if you're not clinging to Christ, you're being pulled down, down, down into the burning fire. Right. where you'll be roasted eternally. Uh, you know, it, you probably remember that John Wesley sermon about that they said people were hanging on to trees so they wouldn't be took down to hell after that sermon. And, and uh, but you know, that's found out later they were students uh, from the Calvary Church. And, and so, you know, the, the common evangelical point is that unless you accept Christ as your Savior, you're going to go in the lake of fire. And even if you have confessed him as a Savior, if you're not, you know, focused on Christ continually, you could be being pulled down as, as you're walking into the, into hellfire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they really stir people up with that, but that's their message is, is, you know, most people are going to hell and make sure you're not one of them. And you're going to burn and burn and burn forever unless you accept Christ right now. And, and you know, uh, and... Uh, it's a very good negative motivator. Yeah, yes. But usually people who are motivated by a negative thing don't stay motivated very long. By the positive. Right. Yes. Well, it's right up there with the third resurrection. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's fear. It's fear religion. In other words, you do this or else. Yeah. And so people do it. We had 150,000 people doing it in the Worldwide Church of God, and how many are left? Because <laughs> fear was the motivator for yes. most of those people. Right. And when the fear went away, and Joseph DeCotch said, oh, well, you don't need to worry about keeping that Sabbath day anymore. You won't roast. Yeah. And the fear went away, and what did people do? Went their way. They went their way because there was no more fear over their head. Yeah. And so fear can certainly fear can motivate people, but well, never positively. <laughs> well, and that's maybe why that Lake of Fire reference is, is so rare. But like you were saying, thirty nine times about you know redemption and yeah. and focusing on the mercy and love. I mean, that's the message. That's the gospel, the gospel of hope that that we, we will see our loved ones. That's what we need to be focusing on. And unfortunately, 
you know, the progenitors of modern day religion have focused so much on that negative message that you, you brought up um, about burning forever and ever. And so I think in order for the message to not be sabotaged is you, you will have the detractors that say, you know, we'll point to Revelation 2015. Um, but I don't think the answer is, well, it's symbolic or it's allegory or, or whatever it might be. It is, look, that's mentioned once, but here's 39 other times where his will is, is very clear. The will is mercy and love. And if, if that is actually true and it's a physical thing it is a last resort it is not it's it's not the initial approach and i i think that that could that could diffuse um which one uh you know those who those who would uh those detractors uh to this this message i think there's a lot of people that want to throw a lot of people in the lake of fire <laughs> You ever get that feeling? <laughs> and they are not like the Father, who doesn't want to throw anybody into the lake of fire. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to throw something out there, this is something that I've, I've kind of thought about. I'm sorry, well done, but I think I remember somebody. Maybe it was you, um, Mark. I can't remember it was you. But we talked about someone was discussing things about the feast, the feast about. Um, the cycles, script, cycles scriptural yes. cycles. Right. Repeat. And maybe I mentioned this to you, and I'm, I think maybe I talked to someone else, but if that's. No, I was, I did bring that up. Yeah, I'm going to say, if that's the case, then this is just speculation that I've just kind of been, been, been stewing with this. Not stewing, but just kind of, you know, just kind of revisiting it once in a while. But since um, a third of the angels were cast down, cast out with Satan out of heaven, if you want to use that term, out of that, then is it a, a distinct possibility, but maybe that's what the book of Revelations may be alluding to happening again, that after, even after a thousand years, that people, that, that people have had no inkling of who Satan was, and no influence, had nothing but the love, the peace, the joy, the mercy, all this stuff, the happy stuff, and yet when Satan is released, for a time, short while, whatever the scripture, you know, whichever you want to use as far as the defining that, they're still going to turn their back on Yahweh. And would that not be a, a comparable thought that this is a cycle happening again, that they're going to be cast a third, possibly a third of the people in that scenario are going to be cast into the lake or going to be cast out with Satan because they followed him, followed him again? Or I don't know. It's just it's a cycle. I'm not saying maybe a third of them are not, but it's it's going to happen again. Right. I I agree. I mean, everything in creation is a cycle. There is nothing that is not a cycle. So why would we assume that the advent of Adam was not the beginning of another cycle? Right. We also see that definitely there was something here more than six thousand years ago. And what that was, we don't know because it doesn't say. I believe that it says in Genesis that the, the earth was recreated. I think the Hebrew supports that more than it was just created right then. And, you know, I, I mean, it starts out in English with in the beginning, which is the word you know, gen, you know the the word translated Genesis, which is Bereshit, and that's such a poor translation of that word. It's it's pathetic because mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's it's like the the word Rashit is the chief, the king, the the head. You know, it's translated many times that way. So you, you have to look at you have to look at that and go, well, was it the beginning or was it a beginning? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole Genesis the beginning of Genesis is a whole 
another discussion and people get militant, militant. about their <laughs> Hello? On that. Can, can you guys hear us yeah. oh yeah now we're nice and loud and now you're much better sorry <laughs> I, um I th the headset's broken so he didn't know if it was muted or not um I, I, and again, forgive me if I have the wrong spot, the the one about and Peter where things melt with a fervent heat. I think the continuing of that, paraphrasing horribly, is um, how much more so, you know, basically your, your works should, uh, I mean, if you know that that's what the end is, the end of the cycle, then your work and the, in your deeds and the things that you do uh, should be the kind of things that would persevere through that uh, that cycle, I guess. I'm translating mm -hmm. that here. But and in James 3, it talks about that also. The cycle yeah. of Genesis, you know. And uh, it says the tongue is like a evil, you know, thing that destroys the entire cycle of Genesis. Uh, I, I don't know the verse, but it's James 3, somewhere in James 3. It's an interest, it's a very, very interesting verse, and I think it ties in with, with Ezekiel's wheel. And, you know, you, you read the, you know, when you read about Ezekiel's wheel, it seems very confusing, but if you think of cycles, instead of like wheels turning, you know, and think of Ezekiel's cycles that he's seeing. I think he's seen he's seeing these cycles of Genesis. This thing keeps going around and around. You know, we call it Ezekiel's wheel, right? <laughs> it's Ezekiel cycles, and so even in heaven, there are cycles going on. Everything, and then you look at creation. Just look out your window. What do you see? Spring, summer, winter, fall, spring, summer, winter, fall, spring, summer, winter, fall, you know. You see the moon, it cycles all the time, every 29 and a half days, right? And the sun cycles, the stars, it, look at the heavens, you know, look at the progression of the equinoxes. Everything is cycling, everything. And the holy days. And the holy days, right. Well, the holy days are a picture of what? The kingdom, right? I mean, so, you know, and so to think that there is an end all of a sudden and that the cycle doesn't keep cycling, I think is a mistake. That's what I think. And so, you know, I just, I see all these things and we see through a glass darkly, <laughs> you know? And so all we can do is think on these things, pray about them, ask for revelation and inspiration and, do the best that we can. It doesn't, it's not salvational whether you believe everybody's going to be saved or not. It's just an idea that I have. And I like that idea because I like to think that everything's going to turn out good mm -hmm. and evil is going to be conquered and good is going to prevail. And that's basically, I think we're seeing the same thing Err on the side of mercy and love. Um, and in defense of the speaker who gave that horrible eighth day message, he did have this thing called the rope of hope. And it was a very long rope and about two inches of it was pink. And that's the human lifespan. And about 12 inches was black. And that was the millennium. But then there was this rope that went on and on and on forever. I don't know, maybe 300 feet or so. And his point was that we spend so much time focusing on the black tape, the 12 inches of that really long rope, not really thinking about, you know, like you were saying of his government, it shall never uh, end. It will continually increase. You know, what's beyond? Um, because this is all just a, it, it, it's like as a child, you know, you're born, you're, uh, you're reared, you become a young adult, again, all these different cycles. So who's to say there isn't something similar in the, in the spirit realm? Um, you know, we, we, uh, we get our learner's permit during the thousand years. And after that, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> who knows? Really, that, really, the story doesn't continue on. You know, I mean, it, it brings us to that point and it kind of just, 
says, okay, and then it gives you this little glimpse in Revelation 21 and 22. And that's it. And that's, that's it. it, you know? It's <laughs> like, <laughs> there is no Revelation 23. <laughs> But, but if you're erring on the side of mercy and love and really and truly trying to align your heart and your mind and your soul with the will of the Father and the Son, that seems perfectly clear. Yeah. Even though we've only been giving breadcrumbs, um, we're able to make a cake, I guess. Or, that's a horrible analogy. No. And I prefer my cake to be a happy one. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I have literally hundreds of friends who were in the Worldwide Church of God keeping Shabbat and now no longer do. In fact, my very best friend is in that situation. And I hate to think that God would not have mercy on these people. These are not bad people. They're not evil people. Did they fall away from the faith? Yes, they did. Maybe they never had the spirit. That's more, did they you fall know? away or weren't they? Maybe they just weren't right. part of it. And, 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 right. and another point, which is, uh, I think is valid, is that they're continuing to learn. In other words, they don't understand everything, which right. none of us do, but they're still learning about the New Testament, they're learning about grace and mercy and kindness and, and those things. Now, you know, sometimes I think, well, the, the diabolical liars at the top that <laughs> went about to control and deceive everybody, well, what about them? I think they're going to pay a price for that. Yeah, but I don't think they're, you know, because see, they didn't know either. Right. See, <laughs> I remember the story when uh, Joe Takach Jr. said that he and his buddies sat down and really studied the Bible for the first time. And they just sat with their computers and read out of the NIV. I mean, they, they're being second generation. Right. Their minds were elsewhere all the way through. They were in the church, but they were clueless. I mean, right. they, so, okay. They didn't have to make a determination until the church broke up. And then suddenly it was like, hey, it's your responsibility to know what's going on. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, I was third generation Worldwide Church of God. And so I just went along, let's say this, I went along fat, dumb, and happy. <laughs> okay. Until at age 45, uh -huh. I, was, I was forced to study the Bible because I needed to know some things. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, how many sermons had I sat through by the time I was 45 years old? I, it's got to be in the thousands. How many Bibles, correspondence courses did I do? How many booklets did I read? But you know what? When, it came, when push came to shove, I didn't know the answer. So when they said, you don't need to keep the Sabbath, I went, well, maybe you don't. I better get my Bible out. Mm -hmm. And then I did. And then I went but I don't know how to study this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, I think, you about know. a lot of people, and, and some people are just offended and are still discouraged. Right. And they're downhearted, and, and they need someone just to encourage them and lift them up. Right. Maybe more and not them criticize them. Right. Not beat them over the head. Right. Just say, hey, God loves you. And yeah. right, it's all going to work out in the end. It's all going to work out. You know. Well, and, and going back to, um, and I'm breaking one of the cardinal rules of any interactive discussion, and that's bringing up a person's name who's not in the circle. Um, but this person brought up Hebrews 10, 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice. Oh, that was the other scripture. Left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the one that many use to basically say, oh, that's it. You're going to get thrown in the lake of fire. Well, I I hate that attitude. But I, that one definitely uses the word eon. Mm -hmm. And if you search out the word eon, it does not mean forever. It only means to the end of the age. Yeah. And that okay. uses eon twice. So it's the ages and the next age to come that that person does not repent. Does that mean they never repent? 
Well, the, this, this is the thing I, I was so amazed about my dad, is that as much as he was against the Worldwide Church of God, he came in just as the Tkach era was starting. Oh, right. And so he was a big promoter of the Tkach uh, program. program. And I tried to talk to him about this. I said, but you know, the only church in the whole world that teaches that people will be resurrected to live again and receive the Holy Spirit after they're resurrected as a human is the Worldwide Church of God. There is no other church out there other than Kabbalah. Right. You know, make and that the Jehovah's Witnesses kind of touch on yeah. it. Yeah. But I mean, a it, it was it, a firm doctrine of the worldwide church. Yes, and he <laughs> believed that passionately. He just, just, and which I agree with, you know, I right. believe in it too. So I wasn't arguing. I just said, where did that teaching come from? Not the Lutheran church, you know, not the Baptist church. And, and he just hated Herbert Armstrong so much that he could never admit that there was one thing Herbert Armstrong ever did right. And so I got nowhere with that conversation, mm. but... Uh, well, was it Herbert? I think it was. It, well, I don't think it was Herbert. I think it was Loma. Well, no, this I was... I think Loma's uh, study led this yeah. whole thing in that direction. This, this, I know the story of Mr. Rod Meredith. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's an honor, honorable source, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, as when Ambassador College first started, they had some of these roundtable discussions going on, mm -hmm. and and uh, Herbert Armstrong told the students, "Okay, study this and prove it wrong." So it was the whole subject was in the fifties, in the beginning era, and and one thing that I try to remind people of too is I know from the early articles is, is that. They prayed about everything at that point, mm -hmm. and everything was about Bible study. They were zealous. It was a movement. Right. It wasn't an institution then, and, and, and I believe that a lot of things that we can be appreciative came during that time period when there was a lot of zeal and, and true sincerity, but then once it became a multi-million dollar corporation. It became a religion. An institution. Right. And, and, and Well, after Loma died. And that's a that's a correlation there. That's a very good breaking point because that's when Stanley Rader got over. in and started making it a a, a business instead of right. a, a movement. But regardless, though, of when and how it all started, it, it the doctrine was there. It was developed. We know it today, and we can carry it forward. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, it's kind of like what have we learned? from everything that we've experienced. Good and bad, both, yes. Prove all things, definitely yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because there was definitely some really false teachings going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one, one thing, the, though, I see no. in the whole picture is that... I think I'm muted. No, you're no, not muted. No, no. Oh. The, uh, the thing is that God the Father is the daddy he's the patriarch and the church is in a sense kind of like the the motherly role and so i view our role as fellow human beings as kind of like the nurturing merciful you know that no matter what the child does the mother still will pick him up after the father's beating and you know give him some food and mm -hmm. help him come back around because it's the father that is the one that is in charge of the condemnation. And, and we're not in charge of any condemnation. You know? So I, I think as a fellow believers, our job is to err on the side of mercy and kindness and love and hope. And, and if, you know, say you know a big if let's mm -hmm. say if there is a condemnation to be meted out or a punishment or a judgment that goes to the father right and, and i'm not saying it's a literal i'm talking metaphorical here that we as fellow believers should be continuously being kind to each other merciful 
and assuming the very best always. Forgiving. Yeah, and for yeah, forgiving, as Peggy say, we need and we're commanded, we need to be forgiving. Right. And and, and so if give us our trespasses as we forgive others. Exactly. And so I believe <laughs> even if we don't want to. We, we don't want to. Want to. <laughs> yes. So I believe in spirit with what Mark is presenting that it's a good position to take as fellow human beings. And and I and I think we're all on the same page on that because um, if you err err, and maybe that's not even a good uh, word to use, but on the side of mercy and love, um, what does he say? You know, there is no there is no law against love. No. Nope. So if if that's if that's the position we're taking in how we're reviewing the word, then I really and truly think the spirit, you know, the father will use the spirit to reveal to us his, his intent. And there are only a handful of us um, that we've talked to offline that are in line with what Mark's talking about. Um, like Hal, Hal Geiger and um, Scarlett, you know, we, we've talked to them about this, you know, over a couple, two, three years but we were not afraid to say it to anyone else. Um, but it was just like one of those, huh? You know, maybe they—they they were more like sounding boards. And when they and and then when they said, well, yeah, there there could be something there. And then Mark did his presentation at the feast. Is just like, yep, yeah, that just locks it all into place because it it makes sense. It fits in with the whole lens if you're looking through the lens of love and mercy it just you you can't argue against it i i mean we've got the parable of the prodigal son you know in in reference to your your friends mark who are who've totally thrown away the sabbath and and you know the law and the testimony you, you've got the parable to to cling to because they'll they'll be back right you know, I, I believe they will be back, and and we're but, going to be bringing out the fatted calf and the robes and, and the. Ring. But when they come back, they're going to come back on their own, not out of fear. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but exactly. There's... Because the prodigal son came of his own free will. It wasn't like he was, uh, and and he was repentant. Well, I don't know. It's, no, maybe he wasn't. Maybe that's why the the other son was upset. Um, and that that part's not clear, so that's kind of irrelevant. But uh, the the fact that he would go after the one and leave the ninety nine, I mean, should show that how important it is. And this again ties into your whole message that he he will go after that that very last lamb, right? You know, to 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 bring everyone into the fold. And so that's again why I think the whole thing about the lake of fire is just kind of you know ah, this is my this is a last resort i i'm i'm gonna put it in there you know once um but i i, I don't want to be the father that rules out of fear i want to be the one that rules out of love so i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about love in these 39 other spots and so hopefully They'll they'll focus on the thirty nine, not the one. Of course, they focus on the one. Um, right. the, the negative. <laughs> well, and it, part of the reason we focus on that one is because of we've been told that over and over and over. <laughs> <laughs> True. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Getting back to the prodigal son uh, example. The prodigal son was accepted back. He was the son. He was, you know, the bad calf. You have to see him, bring him back into the fold. But the other brother still had his inheritance. Right. Still had his reward. Yep. Okay. He didn't blow it. And I still think to, you read about to the churches. If you do this, you get this. If you do this, you get that. If you overcome, you will sit on my throne. If you, there are rewards for doing it God's way. That, you know, yes, the other people will have salvation. Yes, they'll have these other things. But the people who do it as God instructs them to do it, 
are going to get a little extra. Right, you'll get 10 cities instead of, you know. Yeah, and you just think work. about this, you know, I'm the captain of a boat and that's all it is, all it is is about responsibility. Yeah. So if some guy falls yeah. off my boat and drowns, guess who is responsible for that? Yeah. So if you give me 10 cities to rule over, guess what? Mm -hmm. That's maybe not such a big gift. That might be work. a big responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> more work. Well, that, that's why a teacher, you know, that offends a little one, might as well have a millstone thrown around their neck kind work. of thing. That's a big um, responsibility. It, it really and truly is. And, you know, we use the parable of the tens, the, the, the talents. Um, and, and there's so many things that we can pull from in terms of uh, the, this whole idea of reward. But there's also the verses of, you know, those who keep the commandments and the testimony uh, and teach them will be called the greatest in the kingdom. But the reverse, what, what are they... What are they called? They're, it doesn't say they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire. No. Nope. What, what, what is going to become of them? They're going to be called the least. In the kingdom. But they're still in. They're in. And, and then we've got the, all the letters to the churches in the book of Revelation. So they had all these things going on, but they still had their lamps. Right? Yep. And the same yep. thing with the, the parable right. of the ten virgins. They all slept. All of them slept. Every, almost every parable is related to the kingdom. Yep. You ever notice that? <laughs> but when you look at the parable of the prodigal son, you also have to look at the son who stayed home because that's us. We have the responsibility. He ran the, you know, he ran the farm, right? He, he inherited it. Mm -hmm. and, and yet the father told him, don't look down on your brother. That's right. Welcome him back. And the same thing with the with the guys who started working in the fields in the morning were ticked off that the people who came in and worked like, you know, five minutes before sundown got the same reward. Yep. The way I've always looked at it is uh, why would I want to keep be beating my head against the wall? Wouldn't I rather have the joy of the Lord every minute I can? And, and that peace that passes all understanding, why would I ever want to go against God? Right. And it's like, it's like when it says in the Bible, it says, you know, many are called and few are chosen. So that's a very difficult scripture to understand until you read the parable that it's attached to. Mm-hmm. And then you can understand it because I prayed about that and prayed about it because I'm like confused about this. So what I wanted to do is change the words into, you know, many are called, but few choose. Well, that's not right either. Right. They're okay. Chosen, yeah. They're chosen. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so if you read the parable that that's attached to, you understand that's a kingdom statement, not a now statement. Right. Right. Okay. Unless, of course, you're referring to the Wisconsin Dells years ago. Well, yeah. many were <laughs> many are cold, but few are frozen. <laughs> <laughs> but there were a few that were frozen. Right. <laughs> but but if you understand it in a kingdom sense, okay, then it also it also fits into what I was saying tonight. If you go read the parable, and you know, I don't want to go dig it up and go through the whole thing because it's a, a long dissertation but you can go go find where it says that and then read the parable that it's attached to because most people just read that verse and they stop and then they go oh wow many are called and few are chosen that means only a few people are going to get into the kingdom that's a leap in logic yeah mm -hmm. it is when you read the parable it's attached to yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's a common belief, right? Only a few of us are going to make it. The rest of you are all going to roast in the lake of fire. Uh, I think there are there are a few groups like that, and, and it does seem like they're obsessively comparing who's in the church and who isn't and who's saved and who isn't. And 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 I, I you know, the one proponent of that, I was in a, a Bible study. It was an open session. And... I brought up some points, you know, 
that I would have disagreed with what he was saying. He just immediately shut me out and dismissed me without explaining one scripture. Right. Yeah. So, well, that was common. Yeah. yeah. So have we covered everything? I or? think so. Okay. So has everybody signed off? No, we got people who still on, but a lot of times we like to do to just open the prayer. Okay. General chit chat. So that'll end the official part of our program here. I'm going to stop the recording.